Hi, I'm Tom Long, and today we are coming from the Ocean Isle, the Ocean Isle Beach uh, Pier, which has been here since 1957, so I'm older than it is. Our scripture for this week is Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 11, and it's known as Jesus' triumphant entry. first verse says, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives. So that's how it starts. So it's talking about them climbing up from the Jordan Valley, ascending up into the mountain range to um, toward Jerusalem. And on the way up, they come to the villages of Bethphage and Bethany. And apparently Jesus thinks this is a good place to stop. And send two disciples ahead on a, on a little mission trip. So the, it continues, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? say, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. Now, Mark doesn't say what kind of colt we're talking about. Matthew shares that the colt's mother is a donkey. Even he doesn't tell us whether the colt is also a donkey or maybe it's a mule that was fathered by a horse with a donkey. <laughs> so that would make it a mule. And the prophecy in Zechariah was that the king of Zion would arrive on a donkey and vanquish all of Israel's opposing neighbors. And Maybe Jesus' use of the donkey points back to that prophecy. Or it could very well be that this is a nod to King David, because the Messiah is often referred to as the son of David. Uh, this may be a nod to King David sending his son Solomon to be coronated as king. Uh, he sent him riding on one of David's mules. A king who depends on military might, might be expected to ride on a powerful stallion. A king who depends on the power of God rides in on a donkey or a mule. <laughs> if we buy into the nod to the King of Zion prophecy or to Solomon's coronation as king, we can see that this is going to be a very Jewish procession tied deeply into their culture. And these ties to Jewish tradition are about to become even more obvious. Or it occurs to me that it could also be a nod to his mother who rode a donkey to Bethlehem to bring the Son of God into this world. In other words, the incarnation. And then of course, there's that other possibility. A donkey is just a donkey. But given the other references back to the Old Testament scriptures in our passage, I don't think so. Going back now, starting back at verse 7, when they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Throwing their cloaks on the ground was how people indicated their support of Jehu having been anointed as king over the house of Ahab, as opposed to the house of Ahab. It, it might be an indication that the people were expecting Jesus to wipe out God's enemies in a bloody massacre, just as Jehu had done. And then going on to verse nine, those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Now, Hosanna was the cry of the people when they welcomed the Messianic King in Psalm 118, verse 25, which literally translated means, 
Lord, save us, I pray. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, they continued. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Well, there is really no doubt that they are recognizing Jesus as their king, a gift from God in heaven. And there is no doubt that the established leadership in their community knew what that meant and what a threat it was, both to their position of privilege and to the uneasy peace the people had with Rome. Finally, we come to verse 11. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything. But since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. When Jesus looked around, it wasn't the way I looked around my closet for my socks as a boy. Jesus intently swept the scene, closely observing every detail. Then he leaves for the night, which would have given him a chance to think about what he had observed and to choose a future course of action. This might be the context for what follows in the next passage in Mark, in verses 12 through 19, the cleansing of the temple. Remember, we consider John's version of the cleansing of the temple on the third Sunday of Lent. That cleansing would have further provoked the Sanhedrin in brokering the relationship between Israel and the Romans. I think the events of this day meant different things to different people. For two disciples, it was that time they had to go ahead on donkey detail while everyone else sat around in Bethany and Bethphage. For those who stayed behind, they witnessed the gathering of an enthusiastic crowd. The crowd was buzzing with expectation that they would at last be set free from the Roman yoke. For the Sanhedrin, it was watching the existing order of things teetering on the edge of future disaster. For Jesus, it was a way to show that he was the Messianic King. As those who have the benefit of knowing future events, we know that Jesus did not come to bring a kingdom of this world. He did not come <laughs> to force his kingdom on anyone. He came to defeat the powers of sin and death that hinder our ability to allow him to reign in our hearts and in our lives. He came to be my king if I choose to receive him as my king. As Joshua once said, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. So you might